Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, about a month ago, we did this video right here. It was about this huge ruling that came out of Kansas that found that 18 United States Code Section 922 subsection O was unconstitutional. What does that do? That's the statute that bans you and I from possessing machine guns. I told you at the time that the United States government was going to appeal, and they have done just that. We're not really going to geek out on that appeal. Instead, that appeal got me to go back and look at this case, and that, along with another brief that I will share with you in a moment, got me going down a deep, deep rabbit hole, and I think I have finally come to a conclusion and hopefully a way to connect all the dots for you. So today... Let's have a very important discussion and let's do some serious geeking out and let's talk about why automatic weapons are protected by the Second Amendment. What do you got there, man? Attack pack. Oh, sweet. Attack pack? Nice. Oh, what's attack pack? Uh, that's the new sponsor of the channel. So what's in a tack pack? Oh, what's in a tack pack? Well, here's the best thing. It is a monthly subscription of all sorts of tactical gear. And I mean, they got a lot of really cool stuff. The best part about it is that they actually have two separate subscription models. So they got their tack pack standard, which ships at $59.95 a month. Best thing about that is it really has a value of about somewhere between $90 and $120. And then they got the tack pack plus. Now that ships at $139.95 a month, but Oh, check this out. They actually have a value of somewhere between $240 and $300. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's super cool. And here's the coolest part yet, because if you sign up right now for the TAC Pack Plus and you use the promo code GUNLAWYT, you're going to get an extra $60 everyday carry kit, which means that your initial investment for less than $140, you're going to be ended up getting over $300 worth of tactical gear. Listen, look at some of the cool things you're gonna get if you subscribe to Tack Pack today. So get down there, check out the link below, make sure you use the promo code GUNLAWYT. Check out Tack Pack. Okay, hear me out. The case we're talking about is United States versus Tamori Morgan. We've covered it, everyone has covered it. This is where a judge has found that 18 United States Code Section 922-0, which prohibits people like you and I from possessing automatic weapons, is in fact unconstitutional. We told you that the government was going to appeal. They have. Now, what that got me to do was to go back and read the court's order one more time. Wanted to do another geek out session on it. But while I was doing that, I also happened to be have in the back of my mind another brief that I had read recently. I did this video about it. It is the amicus brief that the National Association for Gun Rights filed in the matter of Snoke v. Brown, which is a challenge to Maryland's assault weapon ban. Okay, so using some very well-researched points from both the court order and the memorandum, I want you to hear me out because I believe that there is a plausible argument as to why the Second Amendment actually would provide all of us lawful and responsible, otherwise lawful gun-owning Americans, the access to automatic weapons. Number one, the Second Amendment is implicated with automatic weapons. Okay, despite the fact that both the Fourth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit may believe that America's most common platform of semi-automatic rifles is not protected by the Second Amendment. Heller said that the Second Amendment deals with all bearable arms. And if you take a look at the more geekier definition, which is anything that one could take in the hand and use either an offense or defense, then clearly the Second Amendment covers all bearable arms and automatic weapons, machine guns are in fact bearable arms. First point. Okay, second point. The Second Amendment allows us to protect ourselves from both private and public violence. What do I mean by that? Well, when I take a look at NAGR's amicus brief, they correctly point out, In D.C. v. Heller, the court held the right to keep and bear arms is an individual right protecting against both public and private violence. And the court recently reemphasized the dual nature of the right in United States v. Rahimi. Yeah, that's right. Ibn Rahimi pointed out, disarm a community and you rob them of the means of defending life. Take away their weapons of defense and you take away the inalienable right of defending liberty. So it is important to understand that the inalienable Second Amendment rights that God gave you is about the right not only of self-preservation, but also about the right of resistance. 
And this is not a new or novel legal theory. As a matter of fact, you could take a look at some of the great constitutional scholars that go all the way back to the formation of this country. They are the ones who advance this theory. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, Noah Webster, all spoke of the importance of the American people being able to repel a tyrannical government. And then perhaps one of the premier constitutional scholars at the time, St. George Tucker, when speaking in his commentaries on Blackstone about the Second Amendment, was quoted as saying, The Second Amendment may be considered as the true palladium of liberty. In most governments, it has been the study of rulers to confine this right within the narrowest limits possible. Whenever standing armies are kept and the right of the people to keep and bear arms is under any color or pretext whatsoever prohibited, liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Which, of course, then led NAGR in the Snope Amicus to rightfully conclude the founder's preoccupation with preserving the right to keep and bear arms for the purposes of collective action against the tyrannical government has implications for the hierarchy of weapons protected by the Second Amendment. Surely those arms most useful for collective resistance would be at the top of that hierarchy. Okay, now we're cooking. Now here's the next one. Number three, machine guns are in common use. That's right, machine guns are in fact in common use. As a matter of fact, if the threshold can go as low as 200,000, as it was in the Catano case, that explains why the trial court in Morgan found as follows. Moreover, to the extent that the Second Amendment would allow weapons to be prohibited solely on the basis that they are dangerous and unusual, or highly unusual in society at large, as the government suggests, the government has not made that showing here. As the defendant points out, there are over 740,000 legally registered machine guns in the United States today. And this is the exact reason why courts are now are carving out these new rules of law like in common use for self-defense, because they simply do not want to have to work with the numerical value. Here you have a platform of firearm in which there nearly is three quarters of a million of them in the United States. And consequently, especially when you take a look at case law such as Catano and talking about the number of stun guns, it cannot be said that there's anything unusual about an automatic weapon. Okay, number four, there's no history that would justify 18 United States Code Section 922-0's ban. As a matter of fact, when we really take a look at the history of automatic weapons, they were not first regulated, regulated until 1934, and then there was no real ban on automatic weapons until the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986. And furthermore, any of the historical analogs that the United States government attempted to use in the Morgan case that justified 922-0's ban, yeah, that dealt with how a person carried and or where they carried particular types of arms. They offered no historical analogs whatsoever to talk about an outright ban on possession. And then finally, the Miller case from 1939, essentially the genesis of the common use doctrine, yet it actually also supports the premise that the Second Amendment is designed to provide access to lawful responsible Americans, the access to military grade weapons. Don't believe me? Consider this. In Miller, the Supreme Court rejected a challenge to the National Firearms Act prohibition against carrying an unregistered sawed off shotgun across state lines. Interestingly, over half the opinion in Miller was devoted to explaining how in the years preceding and immediately following the enactment of the Second Amendment, one of the lawful purposes for which law-abiding citizens possessed modern, for that era, of firearms was for service in the militia. The court surveyed several laws from that era that not only permitted, but essentially required law-abiding citizens to provide for their own use modern military style small arms. Against that backdrop, the court concluded that a sawed off shotgun was not the type of weapon that would be useful for military service. So according to Miller, the usefulness of military service is one of the components by which we will analyze whether or not the second amendment protects us. And clearly the types of firearms that are most useful in military service today would include automatic weapons. And then again, if the Second Amendment not only protects your right of self-preservation, which it does, but also preserves your right of resistance, which it does, 
We have to acknowledge that small handguns, pump action shotguns, bolt action rifles are not the appropriate type of weapons that would be useful in repelling a tyrannical government. And so for all of that reasons, that is why we conclude that the Second Amendment does in fact protect automatic weapons, and therefore you are probably entitled to access to a much wider array of firearms. Listen, we're going to go ahead and link up everything that we relied upon in coming to this conclusion down below so that you guys can geek out on it for yourself. Maybe you got your own conclusions. Would love to hear them. If you got any other questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington gun law by now. But if you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. Maybe you got an idea for a video we should be doing around here. If you do, go ahead and click on that link right there and let us know because it's probably going to be better than any idea that we come up with. If you just want to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, the ability to do all of that is down there in the description box. And then finally, and most importantly, let's everyone remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here on this channel, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. And stay safe.